Bueno, muy buenas tardes a todas las personas que se van uniendo a esta sesión informativa. Gracias por unirse a esta nueva sesión donde hablaremos sobre un nuevo convenio que hemos firmado este año eh, para brindar beneficios para ese posgrado en el exterior. Entonces, como ya lo sabrán, hoy estamos con Pennsylvania State University, específicamente con la Facultad de Derecho, donde buscamos que ustedes puedan conocer la oferta que se brinda, asimismo como este nuevo convenio que les mencioné que hemos firmado, y que en este caso les puede dar un beneficio de un descuento mínimo del 50% en el valor de la matrícula. Así que si alguno está interesado en acceder a este gran beneficio, los invitamos a que se postulen a una próxima convocatoria del programa Crédito Beca, que abrirá el 9 de enero del 2024. Así que tendrán a partir de esta fecha, al 29 de febrero del mismo año, para hacer su postulación con alguno de los programas de las universidades de convenio. Y en este caso, ¿por qué no hacerlo con uno de los programas de LLM o de la Facultad de Derecho, que en este caso imparte la Universidad de Pensilvania? Así que sin más introducción, los invito a todos a que participen en esta sesión, conozcan de este nuevo convenio y sobre todo cualquier pregunta, cualquier inquietud que surja en el camino, no duden en escribirla en la cajita de Q&A y al final de la sesión vamos a responder cada una de esas inquietudes. Así que sin más introducción, voy a dar la palabra al representante de la universidad, quien hoy nos acompaña y quien nos va a brindar toda esta información de utilidad junto con un estudiante de un programa actualmente de LLM, quien también nos va a poder brindar eh, esa experiencia que ha vivido hasta el momento. Así que, thank you so much for being here, Anthony. You can go ahead and start your presentation. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Velasquez. It's so nice to be here. Thank you so much for having us. And as I was saying, it's Labor Day here in the United States, and it's a it's a day off for many of us. But I tell you, I'm so delighted to be here with all of you, and I have my colleagues here joining me. We have uh, with uh, with me today. We have uh, a current LLM student all the way from Nigeria, and his name is Izuchuku Asogwa. And I will introduce him more momentarily. And we also have with us today Brian. Carter, who is a Penn State Dickinson Law alum. He finished the, his JD degree with us, and I will introduce him more thoroughly here in a moment. If you're just joining us, everybody, thank you so much for being here. Welcome. I'm going to take a moment to share my screen. Give me a thumbs up, Izuchuku, when you can see that. Okay, very good. Okay, folks, if you're just joining us, please note that the uh, the uh, chat room is open. And so if you have some questions that you would like to pose, feel free to use the chat. Also, the Q&A function is open as well. So if you would like to ask some questions there, you can do so. Um, now, we, we have a relatively small group tonight. So let's um, make sure that this is about you and that you get your questions answered. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, my name is Anthony Ogden and I, I am currently just right across the street from Dickinson Law or Penn State Dickinson Law, where I serve uh, in, in ways to support our international programs and our graduate education programs. And I'll tell you about those here in just a moment. Um, but first, let me give you a bit of the agenda today. Uh, first, I'm going to describe a, a little bit about uh, Penn State Dickinson Law, and then, but more specifically, focus on one program here. That's the Master of Laws program. Now, I will also then ask, uh, invite Brian to give an alum perspective about what he learned here at Dickinson Law and how it's helping him as a practicing attorney today. And then we'll turn to a current student, as I mentioned, uh, Izuchuku here, who is a current LLM student, and we'll hear from his, pers his perspective. Now, we have plenty of time tonight for questions and answers, but don't wait until that point in the program. So feel free to use the chat function and use the Q&A. Now, I'm speaking English, but I've been able to put the slides today in Spanish. So Feel free to um, use English or Spanish for your questions, and I'm sure Brian or Ms. Velasquez or somebody here can help translate because unfortunately, very unfortunately, I do not speak any Spanish. 
And I have been to Colombia twice. I've been all throughout South America. So shame on me. I should learn Spanish. But for tonight's program, unfortunately, it's apologies. Um, anyhow, let's talk a little bit about Penn State University. Now, I hope everyone here has heard of Penn State University. It is a major university here in the United States. It is a top 1% uh, ranked university in the world. So it is a, it's a very prominent university. You can see Penn State people all around the world, no matter where you go. Next week, I'm in Switzerland, and I'm sure to see Penn State alum there while I'm in, in Switzerland. Now, the partially, it's a big, uh, it's, it's not just a highly ranked institution, but it's also a very big institution. There are actually 24 campuses across Pennsylvania. And among, uh, we're attending those 24 campuses are roughly 90,000 students and, and, and just about 20,000 professors and, and staff as well. So it's a very big university and it's a very prominent institution. Um, now, as I said, we have 24 campuses. Now, specifically, one of those campuses is Penn State Dickinson, uh, Penn State Dickinson Law, and that is the campus located in Carlisle University, and uh, uh, Carlisle City in, in Pennsylvania. And I'll give you a map of that here momentarily. But it's one of it's it's in fact not just a preeminent law school. It's one of the oldest law schools in the United States. It's certainly the oldest law school here in Pennsylvania. Now, uh, it is uh, an ABA accredited law school, and you may have seen in the news recently that because Penn State's so large that we actually have two law schools. We have Penn State Dickinson Law and Penn State Law. But going forward this year, we are reunifying the two law school campuses into one with the primary location here in Carlisle, and it will be called Penn State Dickinson Law. So, in, in fact, if Brian has a wonderful picture behind him of our main uh, law school building here in Carlisle, and this is Penn State Dickinson Law, similar uh, photograph. Uh, here we offer three major programs, our JD, or that's the Juris Doctor program. That's the first degree in law in the in the United States. Then we have a Master of Laws program, what we'll talk about tonight, that's the LLM. And we also have a Doctorate of Law, or SJD, or Doctor of Juridical Science. So we have the three programs here. We're gonna talk about the LLM. Now, in a moment, uh, we'll talk about the qualifications for the LLM program. But remember, you should already have, or will have, a first degree in law which in generally would be like an LLB or some type of uh, first degree in law there. I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, uh, welcoming uh, all of our new students each year uh, is our Dean. This is a picture of Dean Danielle Conway. She uh, is um, our Dean and she's a very powerful and welcoming Dean indeed. And she also has an LLM degree unfortunately not from Penn State Dickinson Law, but she has an LLM degree from George Washington University. And she, among all of us, will be welcoming you here to Dickinson Law. Now, let me stop for a second. And once again, as others have come into the room, let me thank you uh, for being here tonight. And especially everyone, thank you. Uh, please share um, me in thanking Colfer for arranging tonight's webinar. I had the pleasure of visiting Kofutoro in Bogota not so long ago, and I got to meet Ms. Torres and other members of, uh, of the team there. And I was so very impressed that we actually created a partnership. And that partnership has led to tonight's webinar. So as you can see on the screen, uh, that any of you who receive funding through Kofutoro will be able to receive a minimum scholarship of 50% of tuition. That's a huge bonus for cultural students and of, of course for Colombian students to come to pursue an LLM degree. 
So thank you, uh, Ms. Torres and all of your colleagues there for that and for having us here tonight. Now, let me talk a little bit now more uh, carefully about the Master of Laws program. This is our LLM degree. It is a one-year degree program or two semesters. It is residential, which means you need to be here in Pennsylvania to take the degree. Now, our program, our LLM program is um, highly selective insofar as we're only generally enrolling around 10 to 15 new students a year. This year, we do not have not even one Colombian student. So I'm hoping next year we have at least one or two Colombian students. Um, and as I said, it is, uh, you do, if you are receiving funding through Colfutoro, you can receive a minimum of 50% scholarship and that is automatic. You do not have to apply to receive that scholarship. Now, folks, as we go along, um, please remember to use the chat function. Isuchuku, could you use the chat and just get everyone started in their in communication there? And feel free to use the Q&A and I will address any of your questions as we go along. Now, the, as I said, the Master of Laws program here and at most places is a one year degree program or two semesters. And we have, and when you're here, you need to take 12 credits a semester or 24 total credits to graduate. Now it's important to note that our LLM degree is a generalized LLM. What that means is you can pretty much take whatever courses you want. An LLM degree is an advanced degree. And so here you can take whatever courses you want, but there are three required courses of every LLM student. The, the legal research course, a legal writing course, and an introduction to US law course. Um, and then most students will need to, but, well, you have to take at least one of these courses, but most of you will take more than one of these courses noted, noted here. Now, um, I see Laura's question in the chat, in, in the Q&A. Thank you, Laura, and welcome to tonight. Um, we do have a, a doctorate law program. Now, we're not going to talk about that immediately, but when we get to the Q&A function, we can go, take our time and really talk about that doctorate program. It's a very uh, small program. We usually only welcome one or two students a year into the doctorate. And for the doctorate program, you do need to have a first degree in law and a second degree in law. So, for example, an LLB plus an LLM in order to be eligible for the doctorate program. We can talk more about that, Laura, momentarily. And then, um, as I said, our program is generalized. So some, some programs in the United States for LLM, they, they are specific, meaning you take a, an LLM in business law or an LLM in intellectual property or an LLM in taxation. Here again, ours is a generalized program and that's very, very important because it gives you a lot of flexibility because most students, when they come to the United States to pursue an LLM, they want to take a bar exam. So if you already have a first degree in law and you come to Penn State Dickinson Law and you take a second degree or our LLM degree, most likely you will be eligible to sit for, in this case, the New York bar. In fact, most LLM students do take um, sit for a bar exam and the vast majority do so in New York or California. So most of our students take the New York bar exam. You're not obliged to take a bar exam and you can take a bar exam elsewhere, such as in the state of Pennsylvania, if you have the credentials to meet the eligibility for those. So as I was saying, our program is generalized and the reason it's generalized is because in order to be eligible for a bar exam, you need to take certain courses while you're here with us. So you need to have that flexibility. But think about it, you come here for one year, you stay in the United States after the program for one year, we call that optional practical training. 
whether you come to Penn State Dickinson Law or study elsewhere, you can stay in the United States for one year for optional practical training, or essentially you can get a, a job for pay for one year. And during that one year, you can sit for the New York bar. And then assuming you pass, then you will become theoretically a licensed attorney in the United States or certainly in the in the New York jurisdiction. Now later, Brian, you might have something more to say about that. So I'll let you jump in in a moment. Um, so anyhow, so the, here you see a little bit more about the New York bar exam. So if you come here, for example, you'll take these courses, for example, in the fall and courses in the spring. Again, it's only two semesters, so you really have a lot of time, but you can take these two courses and then you can be eligible to take the New York bar exam, most likely. Now, let's talk about the admission requirements. In order to be admitted, as I said a moment ago, you have to have a first degree in law. And that would be your abogados or uh, an LLB or something akin to that. You need a first degree in law. We prefer for you to have some experience in practicing law there in Colombia or elsewhere. And then you need to have English proficiency. I should tell you, if you're having trouble understanding me right now, despite my accent, if you're having trouble understanding me, you're probably not ready for law school in the United States. I think that would, Brian, would that be a fair assumption? I would think so. And a lot of it is just being able to understand the accent. Your English might be good, but I can tell you from learning Spanish that um, I learned Spanish in Ecuador. And I started out in a city called Cuenca up in the Andes. I spent six months there. Got done there, and my Spanish I thought was great. I got down to the coast to Guayaquil, didn't understand anybody for two weeks. Wow. Wow. It was the same Spanish, but the accent was so different. Um, so just, you know, just the, the biggest thing with learning the English is practice, practice, practice. So we do ask that, thank you, Brian, we do ask that you have a TOEFL score or an IELTS score or Duolingo or something but if you think you're not so sure, then we can set up set up an interview one-on-one. -on -one. You and I can meet together one-on-one -on -one over Zoom and we'll talk about it. So let me know. Generally, we do interview all of our applications applicants anyhow, but do, do make sure that you have enough uh, English in order to pursue law school. And to Brian's point, it's not just speaking and listening, it's also reading and writing. And that's usually harder than you would imagine, because in law school, you have to do so much reading. Izuchuku, do I see your head shake? There's a lot of reading, isn't there? <laughs> okay, so then let me talk a little bit about the application itself. Um, in the application, uh, it is this is very, very important. If you think you're going to apply to Penn State Dickinson Law, please note that you cannot apply directly. You must apply through the Law School Admission Council or LSAC. The instructions are on our website. So if you just go to LSAC and you look at the uh, application requirements there, you'll see that you need to submit a personal statement uh, and the other things that are noted there on the screen. But let me just stop. The personal statement is very, very important because that is the, your opportunity to explain why you want to do an LLM degree, why you want to do an LLM degree in the United States, and why in particular do you want to do an LLM degree at Penn State Dickinson Law. So make sure you use your personal statement to provide a compelling rationale. Now, as Kofutural students, you may automatically, you, you will automatically get a 50% scholarship, but you could get more. And your personal statement is very critical to actually even getting a higher scholarship. We can talk about that if you have questions, so feel free to use the chat function. Now, with that, and I've already tipped my hand, we have Brian Carter with us. And Brian uh, is someone I'm only just now getting to know. He is an alum of uh, 
Penn State Dickinson Law. He graduated uh, back in 20, uh, 2006. That seems like such a long time ago, um, but apparently not so long ago because now your 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 kid is uh, going to college. Anyhow, he is a uh, he's an expert in uh, real estate law and corporate law. And currently he's working at an organization, a very large organization called Rudders. Um, and he can tell you a little bit more about that. Now, folks, Brian mentioned a moment ago that he lived in Ecuador. And and though I'm very envious of that, Brian, um, he actually speaks Spanish, whereas I do not. So, Brian, I'm going to pose a couple of questions to you. Feel free to answer in whatever language you feel comfortable in. But I have to ask you, uh, why did you choose to do a JD degree and why at Dickinson Law? Um, I'll start in English and switch to Spanish. Okay. Um, well, just as a little bit of background, like Anthony said, my name is Brian Carter. I am a Dickinson Law alum. I am originally from Southern California and moved to the state of Utah when I was in high school, um, stayed there for college. I spent um, two years in Ecuador serving a church mission, and that's where I learned Spanish. And I've been home from Ecuador for about 25 years now. So my Spanish the fluency of my Spanish kind of depends on the day. Some days it's great, and some days nothing wants to come out. Um, when I was in college, I got married. And my wife is from the Washington, D.C. area. When I was um, thinking about what I wanted to do with my life, I had known a couple of lawyers when I was younger, not very many. I, but I took a business law class when I was in high school. And that kind of piqued my interest in law. After I returned um, to the United States from Ecuador, I got a summer job with an insurance company. And one of the things I had to do was go through a lot of their records. And a lot of those were court filings. And I had a lot of questions that I ended up asking their attorney that they had on staff there. And that kind of piqued my interest a little bit more in law. And when I was in college, I. You know, I thought about what I want to do. I took some um, self-assessment um, tests type things that you can do. And one of the things that came up on there was be an attorney. And so after talking about it with my wife, we decided, yes, I want to go to law school. And one of the things that always intrigued me about being a lawyer was you're always learning something new. And... So when I decided, okay, this is the direction I'm going to go, I want to go to law school, the next question was, where? At the time, there were about 180 different law schools across the country. Were you in California when you were making this decision? I was in Utah. Oh, in Utah, okay. Yeah, I did my undergrad, I did my bachelor's degree at Utah State University. Okay. And um, so I had to decide, where do I want to go? And in talking with my wife about it, her input was, you can go wherever you want, but nowhere in the middle of the country. Hmm. She didn't want to go, end up in Nebraska or Wisconsin or Kansas, any that part of the country. I said, okay, fair enough. And as I started looking around and researching schools a little bit, um, I was looking on the West Coast, California, Oregon mostly, and the East Coast. On the East Coast, I focused on the Mid-Atlantic region. So within about four hours of Washington, DC, because that's where, where my wife was from. And one of those schools is the Penn State Dickinson School of Law. And I said, okay, I looked at it, liked it. One of the things I did like about it was they, for years have had a very strong international program. Um, and brought in LLM students from all over the world and also conducted classes in Canada and Europe at the time during the summers. And so I decided, what the heck, I'll give it a shot, I'll apply. Well, when that big envelope arrived at home saying, congratulations, you've been accepted, I kind of knew that's where I'd end up because it was an hour and a half from my wife's family. And so that's what kind of led me to choose to go to Penn State Dickinson over options I had in California and in Oregon. And um, you know, one of the things I really liked about Penn State Dickinson was it's in Carlisle. Carlisle is 
about a half an hour from Harrisburg, which is the Pennsylvania State Capitol. And it's also about an hour and a half from Penn State's main campus. And the nice thing is when you're in Carlisle, you get to focus more on studying law. And so that's what kind of brought me to, to Pennsylvania to begin with. I've stayed because I've enjoyed it. When I first started law school, um, like I said, I was like I said, I was married and I had a four month old son. That son is just finished up his freshman year in college himself. And we've stayed in the area because we like it here. It is a great location. Um, it's a very safe location because I know for a lot of international students, that's a, a big concern is how safe is it? And Carlisle and Central Pennsylvania in general are very safe areas. Um, but we're about two hours from DC. It's about two hours to Philadelphia. It's about three to New York. It's about three and a half to four hours to Pittsburgh. So it's a very centrally located area. And when I was a student at Penn State, I um, I had classmates that were from all over the country. Um, I had classmates from Europe, from South Korea. There were a couple from um, Argentina at one point, some from Africa. And those students from the other countries were LLM students. They were in the same classes with everybody else. So for your business law class or professional responsibility or whatever, you're in those same classes, which is great because those LLM students can bring a di very different perspective on things from their, um, their cultural background, from their law experience practicing in another country. And that just helps enrich the overall education. Um, Brian, let me just jump in and pick up a couple of quick things that you've said about the location. I like to think of it as the best of both worlds. Camilla uh, is asking a question in the Q&A about cost. And I'm going to talk about cost uh, here momentarily, Camilla. But one of the things that students tell me they like, and as a resident of Carlisle myself that I like, is that you have the best of both worlds. You can easily get this. And by the way, Carlisle is in Cumberland County. And this is, I would argue that this is perhaps the legal seat of Philadelphia, is the legal and political seat of, of Pennsylvania, rather. Uh, but anyhow, it, the, the cost of living here is very, very affordable relative to other urban areas. And so, but that said, you can get on the train and go to New York or Philadelphia. You can get down to Washington, D.C. You really get the best of both worlds. And I think that's really quite wonderful. The other thing, um, Camilla, you ask uh, in the chat, and I'll talk about this as well, about getting a job. So, Brian, let me turn back to you for a second and ask you, so you graduated in 2006, and you, um, I assume you soon thereafter passed the bar exam, and then you were looking for a job, I guess, at some point. How was that, and how was Dickinson Lowell degree received in the community, and how is perhaps, how is it still received for you? So I took a little bit, uh, I took a unique route when I graduated. So I, I actually graduated early from law school. I did it in two and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, not sure they literally let you do that anymore, but no, at the don't. time I could do it. And so that's what I did. So I graduated actually in December of 2006. In the United States, the bar exam is offered twice a year, once at the end of February and once in at the end of July. And if you want to take the bar exam, you have to take one of those two tests. And it's pretty much the, I think it's like the last Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, depending on the state um, across the country. And it's usually a two day exam. And um, if you miss the filing deadline, you got to wait another six months. So I took the bar exam in February of 2007. The rest of my class graduated in May of that year. I went to graduation. I had found out about a week before I'd passed the bar exam. So I was really excited at graduation because I was done. I'd passed the bar. And I can tell you, opening up that email that said, hey, bar results are posted, go log in and look, was one of the most nerve-wracking things I've ever done. Because it's a big test. And it's not easy. 
And um, be, I started my first job out of law school in May of 2007, about three weeks after the graduation ceremony. In Pennsylvania and the Mid-Atlantic region in general, the Dick Dickinson School of Law has a very, very good reputation. There are a lot of um, notable alumni over the years that have strength built that reputation and not only you know me and my classmates and the subsequent classmates but you in the future could help strength build and strengthen that reputation even more and with the Penn State name that reputation actually extends across the country I've been fortunate enough to travel quite a bit throughout the country and I run into Penn State alum all over the place and you know, that Penn State name goes a long way because it is such a strong, respected name in whatever you're doing. And yeah. so when I was first came out of law school, I had, I went and got a job with a private practice firm. I had an offer to work for a judge for a couple of years that I um, ended up declining. And within I think about two weeks of when I started my first job, I had another judge reach out to me wondering if I'd be willing to work with him as well. Because I just started this job, I didn't think it'd be very good if I, you know, started to quit and went to go work for that judge. So I didn't do that. Um, most of my classmates had a job within, I'd say two to three months after learning that they passed the bar exam. And overall, that's a pretty good placement rate. Um, the one other question that Camilla asked is about cost of living. Central Pennsylvania is not very expensive compared to New York or DC or Philadelphia. It's downright cheap. And um, so the cost of the program, like most college programs in the US, it is a little bit expensive. But in Carlisle, especially, the cost of living is not very high. Um, there are plenty of apartments to rent um, that are close to the law school. You don't necessarily have to have a car. Um, you can get around by walking and biking or taking an Uber or something like that. And But yeah, Carlisle is a great place to go to law school. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to, to know that it worked out for you, Brian. Let me bring Izuchuku into the conversation now. Uh, Izuchuku, everybody, um, he's a current student. So I'd love to hear his thoughts on cost of living as well. Now, he, as I mentioned a moment ago, he came all the way from Nigeria and he started in January here. And so he'll finish his LLM degree very successfully, I hope, Izuchuku, in December. Um, now, folks, I have to tell you, he came here in January. It's kind of cold here in Pennsylvania in January. Um, so I think he was a little surprised coming from West Africa. Um, but I noticed if you're if you're in Bogota, for example, right now, it's probably as cold there as it will ever get here in our winter time, I'm guessing. But anyhow, it's um uh in anyhow, he's super welcome. It's good to have you here. Thank you so much for being here. Is it you, you want to pick up on any thoughts that Brian was sharing? Yes. Um, uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. My name is Isichuku, and I'm happy that we are here today. So the, the part I would like to talk about uh, following what uh, Brian said is the uh, cost of living in Carlisle. Uh, I think that Carlisle, compared to other cities, uh, is quite affordable like in terms of uh, rent. Uh, the maybe feeding and every other basic uh, thing you will need as a, a student. And also, um, I, wa I want to also emphasize what he said about the environment. Uh, my former apartment, I had two law firms just below my, my apartment. So the Carlisle environment, it gives you the, you know, the, the, the feeling that you're in a legal environment. There are a lot of law firms here. For instance, if you come and after your LLM, uh, program you would like to you know do your OPT that is the optional practical training. Uh, I believe that you will find a lot of law firms around here that can take you for that. So uh, it's a bit an advantage you know studying in Carlisle where you have a lot of law firms to you know explore in case you want to work in the United States before 
returning to your country or you want to stay back in the United States and work. So that is the aspect of uh, what Brian, has, Brian said that I want to uh, really talk about. Uh, Isuka, why did you choose to come to the United States and why did you choose Penn State Dickinson Law? All right. Um, the reason why I, I personally applied to a few schools, about five of them, and uh, the reason why I chose uh, Dickinson Law uh, is because I made a lot of research about the professors in my area of concentration, that is business law. And I found out that uh, they are well rated in that area. That's one of the reasons why I chose the place. And secondly, the, uh, the Dickinson Law Campus is a small community of lawyers. So the every of the students in the uh, law school are lawyers. So it's not it's unlike other uh, places where maybe like the main campus where you will see students from other courses but here in Carlisle, you are meeting everybody you are meeting here are lawyers. So it's is 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 a is a kind of an avenue to you know create uh, a connection, make connection with people who are in the same area, the same area, the same thing you are studying, instead of just uh, you know uh, meeting people who are outside your area of uh, studies. So and they, again, um, the class commit the class the number of uh, students in a class just like. The highest class you can get is maybe 65 students in one class. So, and that is an opportunity for you to, you know, have a personal connection with the professors. Uh, for instance, in my country, Nigeria, a class can have like up to, let's say, 250 students. So in that uh, scenario, you may not have the opportunity to meet the professors one-on-one, -on -one, maybe ask questions, or if you have anything you want to ask about. So I... The reason that you know coming to a place where the class size is small that means you have a, a, a good number of a faculty member to student ratio of let's say uh one to five you understand so if you are in Carlisle in uh, Dickinson Law you have the opportunity of uh, you know meeting the professors you have free access to them you can ask any question you want so it just creates that uh, connection you understand me so it just creates that connection that you are in a place where you can have access to the professors and ask them any questions you want because of the uh, small class size. Again, uh, um, I also want to talk about the fact that the education law puts every resources in place to ensure that you succeed in your academic career. For instance, the classes are, are recorded. Each class we have here are, is recorded. In the sense that maybe by emergency or anything you miss a class, you can have the opportunity to go back online to you know assess the recorded class. In such a way, you will not miss anything. You will not miss anything, and they have a lot of resources to you know make sure that you excel in your studies. For instance, if you check the library, there are a lot of uh, articles, cases, or there are a lot of uh, you know study aids like Queen B and a lot of them. So this is part of the reasons why I, you know, decided to choose uh, the the consent law. And also, just like uh, Dr. Ogden has said before, it, the LLM program is designed in such a way that you are at liberty, you know, to choose the courses you want to study. Apart from the three basic compulsory courses, for instance, I'm in business law. So I had, uh, last semester I did uh, the corporations, just like courses related to my, you know, career goal. So the the, the LLM program is flexible in such a way that you can just choose the courses you you want to study. So this is part of another reason why I, I chose uh, the Kinsey Law. And also, among the five schools I applied to, I think it's only the Kinsey Law that had uh, the department called the Career Service Department. And I saw someone posted a question about, uh, uh, is it easy to get a job after, after studying LLM? Well, uh, I've not finished my LLM, but I can tell you that there are resources in place that will help you to get that job after studies. For instance, tomorrow I have a meeting with the head, the head of the career department. So their work is to make sure that you have a CV, uh, um, you know, just to take you through the application process and ensure that you get that job. So I think that, you know, for me, considering coming to Dickinson Law is, an advantage, I, I, I'm experiencing it, and I would encourage you to consider the Kinsey Law in your application. Well, that was a very helpful summary, Izuchuku, and I'm gonna have a broader conversation here, but let me provide a, a, a bit of a summary. 
Penn State, as I said, is a very world-class top ranked institution. But because there are 24 campuses, if you come here, you will find a generalized program, but you can concentrate your studies in any particular area. And as uh, Isuchuku said, it is a small campus. So every student studying here is a law student. Every, every faculty member is a law school faculty member. And so that is very, very uh, important to know that you can be quickly immersed in a legal environment. Because, and this is really particularly important for an LLM student because you only have one year. You have to, you, you, your degree is only two semesters. So you don't want to spend a lot, waste a lot of time going to football games, perhaps, but you really want to, even though that's important, but you really want to be able to get to know your fellow students and faculty members and in a very intimate and very um, uh, important way. So I'm, I see a lot of wonderful questions are coming in and I'm going to ask Brian to help me with some of these questions, if you will. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about cost because I see some of your questions are about cost. Now, let me just tell you, folks, hear me when I say law school is expensive. Law school in the United States is very expensive. So if you're serious about taking an LLM degree in the United States, you should have a very, very clear set of goals. Because if you see here, some of the costs on the tuition is around $57,000. Now, these are other things here are estimates, which I think these are very high. But this is the number you really want to look at right here, $57,000. Now, as a COFA total student, you'll get about half of, you'll get 50% at least off. But even then, it's still kind of expensive. So if you're coming all the way to the United States and spending a year of your life in considerable resources, you really do need to make sure you're very clear about what it is that you want to do after the program. This is not a simple decision. Now today we're we're covering a lot of slides and so forth, but we I will I'm always available to you, uh, and I'll give you my email address here in a moment. But I want you to feel free to call me up and or, or we can schedule a Zoom meeting and we can talk one on one about whether or not this is a good decision for you. Now there are many law schools to choose from, so think about reputation, think about the study environment, think about the location, think about which is going to help you best get to your career goals. So let, we can talk about that now. But that said, let me turn to some of the many questions that you have here. Um, let me just scroll back up to the top. Camilla, you were asking about the cost of living. I just showed you a little bit about that. Let me ensure, assure you that the costs are as you want them to be. If you want to live like a student, it will be more affordable. If you want to live like a professional attorney in this area, it might be more expensive. Uh, I have a car, but I do not, um, hard, I very seldom drive the car. I walk pretty much everywhere I go. I find it a very convenient, easy place to live. Um, now, there's another question coming in from Geraldine uh, that I, I'm afraid I do not understand. Maybe Brian, you can help me there. Oh, Brian, let's get you unmuted. Sorry about that. Uh, she's asking about um, the transcripts and the translation of them. Yeah, the LS. Thank you. Uh, the LSAT will, when you apply to study to ten, at Penn State or any place, mostly you will have to provide an official translation of your transcript. Um, and there are very specific protocols to do that. LSAT will provide those protocols to you. Uh, in the previous, students have not had any trouble, but just make sure you follow the steps very, very carefully. Uh, Christian asked about uh, other scholarships. Well, Christian, mostly for international students, I'm afraid, in the United States. Um, we mostly are able to provide tuition-based scholarships like what I mentioned about the 50% for cultural students. Um, unfortunately, a, a lot of other aid is for US citizens or permanent residents. So unfortunately, not a lot really. There's some small grants here and there, but mostly it's a tuition-based scholarship. Uh, and that's pretty much everywhere really. Um, Christian also asks, uh, 
uh, a question that I think is best if Izuchuku answers that question. And Izuchuku, he asks, um, as an international student in the U.S., what's the biggest challenge, challenge you've had to face? Okay. Um, the biggest challenge, um, I would say, studying law in a country that is not your home country, especially in the U.S., where the the type of English they write and speak is not what I had in Nigeria because, as you know, Nigeria was uh, colonized by the by Britain. So, the English is in such a way that you have to. I personally have to read and read before you know I understand the, what they are saying because of the difference. But um, I use the resources provided by the school a lot. For instance, we have Queen B. It's, it's one of the avenues you can use to you know study and understand what I say. And uh, for instance, if English is not your first language, there is uh, an option for accommodation. Here, accommodation means that you can apply, you know, to be given extra time during exam or to use dictionary to, you know, understand what the exam questions, uh, you know, uh, says. So that's part of uh, where I had a little uh, challenge. And also trying to adapt to the American environment, the code and everything. I, I came at the heat of the, the code. So these are just few of the challenges I had. Is yeah. it, have you had any problems in the community as a foreign person? Sorry? As a foreign person here in Carlisle, have you had any difficulty? Uh, difficulty? I can't really remember any difficulty. The, the, the town in, is nice and the people are, are friendly. They are very friendly here. So I don't think I have had the actual, remember any major difficulty I've had. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. Um, here's another question from Diana. Diana, um, I have to tell you, my name is not Stephen Barnes, but I do know who that is. My name is Anthony Ogden. Stephen Barnes is, um, he's me at Penn State Law. Earlier in the presentation, I mentioned we have Penn State, because it's so large, we have two law schools, Penn State Law and Penn State Dickinson Law. Penn State Dickinson Law is the original law school for Penn State University. Penn State Law is a separate law school at uh, the University Park campus. Now that law school is reunifying with Penn State Dickinson Law very soon. So that said, currently, the two law schools are still separate entities. So we you can't go back and forth between the two law schools. So if you apply to Penn State Dickinson Law, Penn State Law cannot see your application. And so if you applied to Penn State Law, I can't see your application. So if you apply there, uh, it's a fine law school, but I cannot answer any questions or even see anything about your application there, unfortunately. Now that will change in perhaps the next year, but currently I cannot see that application. But I would invite you, Diana, to apply to Penn State Dickinson Law if you'd like for fall 2024. Um, I do not think, but maybe Ms. Velasquez will comment, but I do not believe that Penn State Law has any sort of uh, official or formal relationship with Kofutoro. So that may be important to you. If a scholarship is important, uh, it might be best for you to consider Penn State Dickinson Law. Anything, okay, so I think, are there any other questions, folks? Any other questions that you might have? Have I missed any questions? Now, if you are still in the room and you would like to speak and ask your question live, feel free to raise your hand and I can unmute you perhaps and you can ask any questions live. But let me uh, uh, take just a couple of minutes any, uh, to ask both Brian and Izuchuku any advice. Right now, we have these wonderful people in Colombia, most likely, and they're thinking about what they want to do. Any advice that you would offer them? Yeah, yes. Uh, my advice will be in the application process when you're applying for the admission. The most important documents there, apart from your transcript, is the personal statement. 
It is the personal statement that will determine the nature of funding that you will receive. So make sure that in your personal statement, you address uh, important things like maybe if you have had any experience before your uh, why you chose Dickinson Law, uh, you know, just, you know, be specific as to your career goal in the personal statement and why you have chosen to, to you know, to study it in the in personal Dickinson Law. So that uh, document, personal statement is very important in the ap application process. I would say, don't be shy. I know, you know when I was learning Spanish in Ecuador, the only way I was going to do that was by doing it. And coming to another country, going to another country where you, it's not your native language, except the fact that you're going to mess up speaking. People aren't going to understand you all the time. And that's okay. What I learned was as long as I was making the effort, people were patient and willing to work with me. As long as you make that effort, they'll do the same at Dickinson School of Law. The professors have a ton of experience working with international students. They know that you come from a different culture, that your English is um, not as good as a native speaker. And they're willing to work with you. They're willing to help with you. I still, um, it's been, a few years since I've been out to the law school in, in Carlisle. But a couple of years ago, I was out there um, using the law library for some research because the firm I was with at the time didn't have the resources I needed for something. I knew the law school did, so I went out. While I was there, I walked around the halls and ran into a couple of professors that um, I'd known from my days as a student. Um, one of them was Lance Cole. And he, I was talking with Camille Marion, who was, um, I never had her as a professor. I studied outside of her office for a couple of years. That's how I got to know her. I was talking with her, catching up with her for a few minutes. And Professor Cole walked out and he looked at me and said, Brian Carter, what are you doing here? It had probably been six or seven years since we'd seen each other. But he still remembered me. And... Um, I got done talking with Professor Marion and then went into with Professor Cole and we sat there and caught up for a little bit. His daughter uh, was the same age as about the same age as my oldest son. And so it was kind of fun to catch up to, you know, you know, what he'd been up to, what his how his daughter was doing and everything. But that's how the professors are at Penn State Dickinson. They want to get to know you. They want to help you. They, they're there to help you succeed. Let them do it. Anthony, your mic is off. Do you want me to read the questions through the chat? Uh, thank you. Well, hello, Ms. Torres. It's good to see you. I see some of the questions coming in now. I can get them. It's good to see you. Um, everybody, let me uh, let me thank uh, Izuku and, and Brian for those uh, pieces of advice. I want to give you some of my own, but first let me address some of the questions. David asked about the letter of recommendation. Now, again, there's three questions. Truly, all you need to think about is why you want to do an LLM degree, why you want to do it in, in the United States, and why specifically at Penn State Dickinson Law. If you cannot answer those questions, you're not ready. It's that simple. It's a big decision. It costs a lot of money. You need to know, you need to have a compelling reason in your mind and, and so that less, that essay should be the easiest essay to write. Okay, so think about the, those three questions, David. Why LLM degree? Why USA? Why Penn State Dickinson Law? Now, uh, David also asked about, is there a minimum GPA? No, not necessarily, David. We're mostly looking that you have satisfactorily uh, can, uh, completed your first degree in law and that you're ready uh, based on all of the other evidence that you have, um, that you're ready for an LLM degree in the United States. Uh, Ani asked about uh, traveling with one's family. Well, Ani, yes, of course. Uh, as if you're, uh, many of our LLM students are practicing attorneys around the world, 
And so they come to the United States for a year and they bring their families, uh, their, their spouses and children. Their children often enroll in schools here. Uh, I believe, if, if you don't mind my saying, Izuchuku's wife and, and son are here, as are others. And so, yes, indeed, they're most welcome. Um, now, there are re work restrictions, of course, for um, for spouses, so they wouldn't necessarily be able to work while they're in the United States. Um, now, uh, and here's another question about if I apply to Penn State Dickinson Law, can I uh, not also attend the University Park campus? For now, the two law schools are separate. They are distinct, separately accredited by the American Bar Association. So they are completely separated. So if you apply here, you can come here. If you apply there, you can go there. Uh, but you can't bounce between the two, unfortunately. That will change perhaps in the next year or so. But currently, I'm afraid they are two separate law schools. But, and I know this is strange, but one university. So one university, two different law schools. Um, now, Maria, you'll say you ask about um, this, uh, the scholarships. As I mentioned, our program is a, um, a small program. I mean, it's very highly selective. So we only welcome about 10 to 15 LLM students a year. Because it is so highly selective, we have the great privilege of having some of the best and brightest students from around the world. Because of that, we typically are very generous with our scholarships. Now, this in this case, if you're receiving funding via Kofutoro, then you will automatically be considered for a 50% tuition scholarship. But if your application is so very strong, you could receive more than that. Um, so do do think about that, Maria Ojose. And if you are applying, then do let me know and we can set up a one-on-one -on -one Zoom meeting. Okay. Uh, and David, you have a, a major in political sciences. Can you apply for the LLM program? David, I'm so sorry to say, but no, you really have to have that first degree in law because th this is a master's of law. And so you have to have a previous degree. Now, for, it, it is kind of confusing because in the United States, in order to go to law school, for most U.S. students, they have to have a bachelor's degree. And that bachelor's degree will allow them to enter a JD program. But an LLM program is considered the next degree in that sequence. So you would do your first degree, in, in this case, a JD or an LLB, and then you do your second degree, which would be an LLM. Now, uh, so David, you would not be eligible for the LLM program, but you could apply for the JD program. Now that's a three-year program, and you can read more about that on our website, but you can do the JD program, and then uh, you can also then, as Brian has done, take the bar exam. Now folks, we are running out of time, and so let me end maybe this um, note here. You can see on the screen, uh, my name again is Anthony Ogden, and I'm a Penn State graduate, very proud. Um, I, and there is my email address there on the screen. So if you would like to reach out to me, I'm in charge of the LLM program. And to Laura's question earlier, I'm also in charge of the doctor program. So feel free to write to me and I'm happy to address any of your questions and perhaps even set up a one-on-one -on -one Zoom call with you. Uh, now, my advice to you folks is make sure you made the right decision and when you are applying to many schools, think about which school, which program is going to be best suited to your learning style and your career goals. In, in many ways, this is a professional degree. So which program will be best suited for your professional goals? Okay. Now with that, uh, let me um, ask my colleagues if they have anything they'd like to add before we finish up here tonight. Are we good? Yes. Well, uh, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. Uh. We just say thank you for joining us, and I expect to see, uh, some of you in Dickinson Law. You're welcome. Well, that's a very nice way to end it there. Thank yes. you. Yes. And Miss Velasco, thanks so much for having us here tonight. I hope I didn't bore you too much.
Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, everyone. We have a wonderful session. We have a lot of information and thanks for answering all the questions. I saw that we have a lot of questions, so thank you for asking each one of them. Well, it's our pleasure. So thank you very much, everybody. Let me wish you a good evening. And thank you especially to our friends at Cofuturo and to Brian Carter. It's good, good, good to see you, Brian. Don't wait for two years to come back. You only live 20 minutes down the road. Uh, Izuku, I'll see you tomorrow morning. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.